Pentecost. Last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday, and we were talking about Memorial Day, but maybe today we'll talk a little bit about Pentecost. How many people know what Pentecost is about? The word Pentecost is a Greek word, and it means 50 days. And uh, it talks about, uh, it, it refers to a, a feast day that the Jews called Shavuot. And it, it, was, a, it was a day when they would celebrate, uh, they would thank God for the, the harvest. And they would take sheaves of barley and they would offer them up to the Lord on Pentecost. It was also a day that they remembered the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. Because if you read in the book of Exodus, it was 50 days from the time they came through the Red Sea to the time that... God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, so it also represents that. Of course, to us, as we look back, uh, the day of Pentecost is an important day because it's the day that God sent the Spirit into the church. It was the birthday of the church, the body of Christ. Now, when I say church, I don't mean the church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. I don't mean the buildings that we go to, but the church is the ecclesia, the body, the assembly, the called out assembly, the body of Christ, the body of believers. The church is everywhere. Uh, it's not just in one place. There are different congregations, but the church is everywhere. And uh, on that day, and we're going to read it in a minute, on that day, the Spirit descended upon, the Holy Spirit descended upon believers. Now, some folks might ask, well, the Holy Spirit, where was he before that? You know, if that was the day the Holy Spirit came upon believers, well, I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit has always been here and will always be here. If you go to the very first two verses of the Bible, we can get them up there. It says, And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the what? The Spirit of God moved. The Spirit of God moved and breathed. He was there at creation with the Father and the Son. With the, with the Father and the Word. The Holy Spirit was there. If you go all the way to the other end of the Bible, to the book of Revelation, in chapter 22 and verse 17, it said, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. So we see the Holy Spirit there at the beginning and at the ending. In fact, the Holy Spirit has been there from before the beginning because He's the third person of the Godhood, the Godhead. He's the third person. He's always been there. He's always been active. A lot of people think in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was just like not there. But He was active there. There were times all through the Old Testament where the Spirit would move on people. Uh, Gideon and uh, uh, Jephthah and David and Saul, where the Spirit would move on people. The prophets, Peter said that the prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit to speak and to write the words that they wrote. The Spirit has always been active in the lives of believers. King David, when he sinned and he wrote Psalm 51, the great penitential psalm, he said, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. See, they had the Holy Spirit just like we do. All believers have the Holy Ghost. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you're not His. And we read that all through the Word. But then people will say, Well, on the day of Pentecost, if everybody has the Holy Spirit, what was that all about? But well, we're going to read about that a little bit this morning. Because the day of Pentecost was about, not about having the Holy Spirit, because we all got that, but about power. Now, in the Old Testament, there were times when the Spirit gave power to certain people at certain times for certain purposes. But Peter said, this is the time that Joel talked about where he said, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Okay, so that's the time we're living in now. Now, I, I want to just to kind of set this up a little bit. I, 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 I want us to understand why the church is here. Why are we here? Now, we could say that of the church universal or just this, this church, this congregation. Why are we here? Why do we come out on a Sunday morning? It's nice to come out and get with folks and fellowship and pray and sing and worship God. That's good. But what's our purpose? I want you to look at a couple passages with me. First, I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. And all the way to the end, we're going to look at some commissions that Jesus gave to the church. Matthew chapter 28. And we want to start at verse 18.
Actually, I'll just read a couple verses going into it. Then, starting at verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them. Okay, here's what we call the Great Commission. He says, first of all, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Can you say all power? All authority. Everything that is there. It's power over presidents and kings and rulers and dictators. All power. Jesus has all power. He's sovereign. He's over everything. And even though it might look sometimes like he's losing, he never loses. He says, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore, since I've been given all power. Now here's his commission to his disciples and his commission to the church. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. All languages, all peoples, all colors, all races, all creatures. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever. That word teaching gets repeated here. See, that, that really is related to the same word that, that means disciple. We're to go and make disciples. See, a lot of folks get this idea that we go out and we leave them in a prayer and we leave them alone. We, we, listen, we need to make disciples. Not just, you know, lead them to the Lord. That's good. But then once you lead them there, then you need to teach them. He says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the world. I will never leave you or forsake you. It says in Hebrews, he says, I'm with you all the time. This is first commission. He says, I have all power. I'll always be with you. I'm commanding you to go and teach. That's the commission to the church. Okay? Turn with me over to the Gospel of Mark. The very last chapter, Mark chapter 16. And we'll start with verse 14. These are different instances where Jesus uh, spoke to his disciples. You know, after his resurrection, he spent 40 days teaching his disciples. And he said this to them. <clears throat> Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world. As a word, go. He says, go. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature or to all creation. I tried to preach the gospel to my dog, but she doesn't want to listen. Okay. But it's, it's, it's a figure of speech. In other words, we're, there's nobody that's beyond hearing the gospel. There's nobody that's too far gone or that's it's, it's too far beyond our imagination they could ever be saved. There's nobody that doesn't deserve or should not hear the good news of Christ. He said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believes not shall be damned. Now listen, this is not, that's not a scripture to back up baptismal regeneration. That's another topic, but I just want to tell you that, all right? And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. You know, as believers, as spirit-filled believers, we should expect supernatural things to happen. Now, sometimes we try to make them happen. You ain't never going to see me get a rattlesnake up here and dance around with it. <laughs> okay. There's some folks that do that, and if they want to do that, God bless them, that's all right. But I am not going to do that. Okay. But we ought to see, we ought to expect to see God's hand move when we go forth in the power of the Spirit. We ought to expect to see things happen that are beyond natural explanation. Most of you guys know the story about Ralph and Ann. They're going to be here next week. That, that's, a, that's a God thing, the way He worked that thing out. Sent a guy 4,000 miles to hear something that happened 2,000 years ago so he could go back and... Okay. You, you know, that's, that's a God thing. Nobody had that figured out in their mind. We ought to expect supernatural things to happen. He's, he's sending us. He's saying, go. 
Now, turn with me over to the Gospel of Luke. And uh, we're going to go to Luke chapter 24. <clears throat> and we're going to look at uh, verse 46. Jesus was teaching them. Again, this was after his resurrection. And he said unto them, in verse 46, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So when we go and we preach, what are we supposed to be preaching? Repentance and remission of sin. There is a way that our sins can be forgiven. And that re repentance and remission of sin should be forgiven in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power and high. So Jesus is telling him, listen, go back to Jerusalem, wait until you get the gift that I told you you were going to get. Okay? And you're going to be given power to go and preach Remission of sins. Folks don't like to hear about that because if you tell them about their sins being remitted, you've got to tell them they're a sinner. Some folks don't like to hear that. I'm not a sinner. I don't do anything wrong. Okay? One more passage in the Gospels over in the Gospel of John. Over in the Gospel of John. And over in chapter 20. <clears throat> And look at verse uh, 21. Again, this is an appearance of Jesus to his disciples after the resurrection. Matter of fact, this is one of the, uh, probably the first appearance. He said, uh, he said to them, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. There's a song we sing, So send I you. As my Father has sent me. Now, how did God send Jesus? He sent him anointed. He sent him to save sinners. And when he has said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained unto them. Now, now listen, when we read this, it would seem like we have the power to say, You're forgiven. But that's not what it means, if you put it all together. We have the power to preach the word that will bring them to forgiveness. In fact, if we don't preach the word, they won't be forgiven. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How shall they hear unless somebody goes and tells them? Now, all these things we've read in the Gospels, and there's so much more, and this is just a little overview, lets us understand that Jesus wants his church, his body, to go and to preach remittance of sins, to, to go and to teach everything that Jesus taught, to go and preach the word that will save sinners. Now, in the Old Testament, was that their commission? It wasn't their commission. In the Old Testament, God had the nation of Israel. He wanted the nation of Israel to be holy, he wanted them to, to show all the world his goodness and his mercy and his grace. And they didn't do a very good job of it. They didn't. He set them apart. He told them to dress different. He gave them uh, dietary laws that were different. He gave them a worship and, and a tabernacle and all these things that were different. And they were supposed to be, they were supposed to be a light to the, to the nations. And they were sometimes, but most of the time they weren't. But on the day of Pentecost, God did something new. Now listen, salvation is the same in the New Testament as the Old. It hasn't changed. We're saved by faith, right? And the Old Testament was, was busy, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the Holy Spirit was busy in the Old Testament, uh, working and moving. We saw that, we read that. But now, there's something different. Turn to the book of Acts, just a couple pages, to chapter 1 in the book of Acts.
And we'll just start with verse 1. The book of Acts was written by Luke. He says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, meaning his gospel, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So forty days after his resurrection, he taught his disciples about the kingdom of God. He taught was what was to come. But it still wasn't enough. It's good to learn what God's word says. And these disciples of his, they were saved men. They were born again. But there was something, there was something else he was going to give them. He says this in verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, you have heard of me. He said, go to Jerusalem and wait there. He didn't tell them to go out and start knocking on doors. He didn't tell them to go out and start witnessing. And He said, go there and wait. Because there's something you need. If you're going to go into all the world and preach the gospel and turn the world upside down, you, there's something more you need. You're saved. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside you. That's great. You're, you're Christians. You're on your way to heaven. If you die, you're going to go to heaven. But there's something more you need. He said in verse 5, For truly John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with what? The Holy Ghost? Not many days hence. That word baptized means to be immersed. You see, we got the Holy Spirit living in us when we get saved, but are we living in the Holy Spirit? See, that's the difference. See, if you're saved, you got the Holy Ghost in you. That's what convicts you of sin. That's what, you know causes you to want to get closer to God. But the power is when we get immersed in Him. When they therefore were come together, they asked of Him, saying, Lord, will it, you at this time restore the kingdom? See, they still didn't get it. They were still looking for the kingdom. They still didn't understand. They heard the commissions. They heard, uh, you know, they heard His teaching. He'd been teaching for 40 days. They still didn't get the message. And it's not because they were dull or slow. For, it's because they, they had a missing piece. He said, is it now that you're going to do the kingdom? We thought you were going to do it before, but you got crucified. Is it now or now are you going to establish your, your throne in Jerusalem? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own power. He did not give us the Holy Spirit that we could figure out who the Antichrist is and when the rapture was going to happen. That's not, the, that's not the purpose. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be what? Witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in all Samaria and to the other, uttermost parts of the earth. And when he spoke these things, he went up in a cloud. And they were standing there looking at him. Looking at him going up. And the angels came and said, Why are you looking up? Go to Jerusalem and do what he told you to do. And that's what they did. And they waited for ten days. They prayed. It says they were all together in one place with one accord. And what happened? They heard the freight train. They say like when you hear a tornado, it's like a freight train. They never heard a freight train before in their lives because it had not been invented yet. These first century Jews had an experience. They didn't know what to expect. When Jesus said they were going to be baptized in the Holy Ghost, they didn't know what, they didn't know what was coming. They were just waiting. And all of a sudden, a sound like a rushing mighty wind, and tongues of fire fell on them, and they began to speak with other tongues. And the people all around them said, what's with this bunch? And some of them said, what are these things? They're speaking the great works of God. In our language, there were people there from all nations all around because it was a feast day. And they were there from all nations. And they were saying, we're hearing these Galileans speak in our own language. The wonders of God. And some people said, ah, they've just been drinking too much last night. And, said, and Peter said, no, wait a minute. 
Peter, the same guy that denied Christ just, just 50 days before this, he said, I don't even know who he is. The same guy that ran and hid, the same guy that was scratching his head for the, for the last 50 days wondering what was going on, he stood up and he preached the message and 3,000 people got saved. You know what the difference was? It's not that he got some kind of great education. He got the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He got baptized in the Holy Ghost and got filled with power to be able to be a witness. Go ahead. We need the power of the Holy Ghost. It's good to come to church. It's good to learn the Word. That's good. It's good to have, a, have an understanding of God's words, understand salvation, learn how to lead somebody to the Lord. That's wonderful. But we need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Because if we try to do it in our own strength, it's like banging our head against the wall. How many people know what I'm talking about? Well, this word, when, when Jesus said, you'll receive power to be witnesses, it's the word from whence we get our word martyr. That's the, the Greek word, martyr. Now, somebody says, does that mean, you know, they're going to burn me at the stake? No, it doesn't mean that. Here's what it means. When you get the power of the Holy Ghost, and you allow that power to begin to work in you, you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to die. Now, I don't mean physical death. You know, some martyrs, there are people, I tell you what, there are more martyrs in the earth today than there were in the last 2,000 years. People are being martyred, they're being thrown in prisons, they're being killed, they're being put to death because of their faith. That's happening. But it doesn't necessarily mean that's going to happen to us. Here's what it means. We need to die to ourselves. See, this witness thing, it's not just what we say. We think witness, if somebody says, I'm going to go out witnessing, and they go out and they say words. But the witness is more than just what we say. The witness is who we are. It's what we do. And we've been given something the New Testament Ecclesia, the church, the body of Christ, we've been give, given something that the folks in the Old Testament could only have certain times, certain places, for certain reasons. We have it all the time. Jesus said John the Baptist was the greatest man that ever lived up until that day. But he said the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. We know things that John didn't know. We have, and, and John was filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb. If you read about it. Now, when he came in the presence of Jesus, John was in his mother's womb, and he left. In his, he, I mean, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. But we have an opportunity to tap into the power of God, not to name ourselves a, a higher raise, uh, more money, not to, you know, speak things into existence that we want, but to be used by God to spread the gospel to all the world, whether it be in your neighborhood or downtown or in Pittsburgh or in another state or in another nation. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody says, what does the Spirit do? Turn with me back over to the Gospel of John in chapter uh, 16. (laughs) I want to show you this. This was the night before Jesus' crucifixion, and he was telling his disciples that he was going away, and he didn't understand it. They didn't like it. But listen to what he says. John chapter 16 and verse 7. Uh, Let's back up to verse 5. But now I go my way to him that sent me, And none of you ask me, where do you go? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow has filled your heart. They were sad. They didn't want to see him leave. Listen to what he says. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. They didn't know what he was talking about. But he was talking about on the day of Pentecost, when they were in one place and full of course, the, the Holy Spirit would come. And he says, and when he has come, now what, what does this Holy Spirit, you know, there have been people who have given the Holy Spirit a bad name. Come on, you might as well say amen. There have been people, we watch it on TV and see them. There have been people that have slandered the Holy Spirit do all kinds of foolishness. It does not say here that the Holy Spirit came to make us bark like a dog. (laughs) Rough, rough. 
The Holy Spirit did not come here to make us act. Some some people try to make themselves because they said they were they were you know they thought they were drunk. People started trying to act drunk. <laughs> now the Holy Spirit can do whatever He wants to, but that's not why He came. You you can go out bouncing off the wall. You're not going to win anybody to Christ. But here's why the Holy Spirit came. He says, first of all, He will reprove the world. This is verse 8. Reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. His first job is to let the dying world know that they're dying. Not condemning, not judging, not you know pointing a finger and thinking you're better than somebody else. But the first job of the Holy Spirit is to preach a message that will let people know that they need a Savior. Just like I did. He'll reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and, and judgment. Verse 9, of sin because they believe not on me. We need to tell people about Jesus Christ. We need to tell them about what he did for them. Because the world generally does not believe in Jesus Christ. I was not born believing in Jesus. I didn't believe in Jesus until I was about 29 years old. Some of you, it happened a lot sooner. Some of you, it took a lot longer. Some of you might still be working on that thing. (laughs) But he reproves the world of sin because they believe not on me. It's a sin not to believe in Jesus. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. He, he wants to let the world know that there is a way that they can be seen as righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, Abram believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. If you believe in Christ, God sees you as righteous. The moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, I don't care what you've done or where you've been, God sees you as righteous. We have to let folks know that. That they can't make themselves righteous in front of the Father. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. We can't make ourselves worthy. We can't work to get there. We can't struggle to get there. It's only through faith in the blood of Christ. And the Holy Spirit has that message. And of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. We, we, can, the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. He tells them how to get right with God and what will happen if they don't. See, some folks don't want to preach about hell anymore. But you know what? That's part of the message. Somebody says, well, I don't want to believe in God just to get out of hell. I want to get out of hell. I'll do anything to get out of hell. (laughs) Scare the hell out of me. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Please. (laughs) I don't want to see nobody go to hell. (laughs) Especially me. So the Holy Spirit comes, and he warns of hell, and he tells how to stay out of it through faith in Christ. How to get your sins taken. That's the message that we preach. If we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, if we've got the Holy Spirit moving, if we're in the Spirit, those are the words we'll speak. Now listen to what else he says. He says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, okay? Now that's, that's the Spirit's working out there in the world. Now what about in here? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into? Thank you, Lord. you know something? I, 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 I'm, I've never, I'm not afraid of people, if people who are saved, I'm not afraid of them falling into error. Thank you, Lord. you might entertain it a little bit, but you know what? If you've got the Holy Spirit in you, and you're in the Holy Spirit, man, when you start walking over that threshold, that spirit's going to raise up a red flag. You might not understand what it is, but he'll let you know when there's something wrong. There have been people stand behind a pulpit that everything they said sounded good. Have you ever been in that situation where they, everything they said sounded good, but you just something inside you just said, <laughs> you find out a week later or a month later, or, it's like, <laughs> the Holy Spirit will let you know. He says he'll guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Verse 14, he shall what? Glorify me. 
I thank God for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I thank God for the gifts of the Spirit. But the purpose of all that stuff is to glorify Jesus Christ. The cross, the blood, forgiveness of sins, what we're doing here today. That's the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the purpose of the power to be witnesses. We got it all mixed up. He says, He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore said I that he shall rot and shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. A little while and you shall not see me, and again a little while and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. See, Jesus, this, this was no mistake. Jesus knew what was coming. He said, I'm going away. He had walked with those disciples for three and a half years, covered maybe a court, space of maybe about 200 miles. But he knew that something was about to happen that would light them up, that would start something called the church, that would cover the world. Spirit-filled believers on every continent, of every language, of every race, the word going forth. That's when he said, Go ye into all the world. And those, those 11 disciples, they went forth, and Peter preached, and 3,000 got saved, and they went forth, and they began to preach filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to, just normal, everyday, ordinary people, everyday people, no theologians, no Pharisees, no scribes, they just went out, and they began to tell people about that. When, when Peter preached that message on the day of Pentecost, the people said, what must we do to be saved? Listen, if you're speaking God's word, anointed by the Holy Spirit, they're going to say, what do I got to do? To be saved. Peter said, Repent, be baptized for the remission of your sins. Repent. There's some folks that think we ought not preach that repent anymore. But Peter preached it, Paul preached it, Jesus preached it, John the Baptist preached it. I don't know if it was good enough for them. That's the word that we have given to take into the world. But we need the power of the Holy Ghost. See, that, that's part of the package. We need that power to be witnesses, not only to speak, but to live. You know what? I can't live right if, I don't, if I'm not in the Holy Spirit. I don't care how much I know of the Word. I don't care how much I study. If I'm not in the Spirit, I'm not going to live the way God wants me to live. And there's a whole lot of people, man, there's folks that's sitting up in church, living any old way during the week and coming to church on Sunday morning. Man, you need to get the Holy Ghost to teach you how to live. I don't know. I've never been, I've never been one to like to put on. You know, I, I figure we ought to be real, don't you? If I'm not going to be, if, if I'm going to come to church on a Sunday morning and say, go, hallelujah, and I'm going to go live like the devil the other six days, I might as well live the seventh day that way too. You know, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it all the way. <laughs> this Christian thing, if you're not going to do it all the way, you might as well not do it all. And if you want to do it all the way, you need the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit. I need filled with the Holy Spirit every day. You know that? I want to pray in the Spirit every day. I want to see God move every day. If I go, if I go for a while without seeking the Holy Spirit, I find myself getting dry, getting distracted, getting mad, getting angry, yelling at the dog, and my wife sometimes too. And I gotta, and I gotta pray every day. Holy Spirit, fill me up. We prepared the Lord's table today. And, and what we're going to do, we're going to remember what Jesus did on the cross. But he did it. He said, I'm going away for the purpose. I'm going to send you another comforter. I want to ask you this morning before we take communion. How many people here need the Holy Ghost? Need, we need the Holy Ghost. I want to pray. See, we were talking a little earlier. Uh, John and I were talking. I was talking about our neighborhood. And God, 
light us on fire that when we go out of here that people it's been kind of quiet in the hood lately I don't know I don't know what it was like the two weeks we were away but lately it's been kind of quiet here but there are people out there that need to see not only hear our witness but they need to see our witness I pray that God would light a fire under us that we would, first of all, that fire would, first of all, light us up, that we would want to have a, a strong desire to live the way God wants us to live, to be witnesses, to be an example to a lost and dying world, and that we would be willing to open our mouth, that we would move and live in the Spirit, that God could use us to send us to go, whether it be across the street or across town or across the world. You know, God called us to go to Germany. I had absolutely no desire to go to Germany. I didn't. I, it wasn't like, you know, for the last 15 years, I would say, oh, man, I'd love to go to Germany. <laughs> and he had a place. He had a message to bring to people sitting in a church. I don't know how many heard it. I don't know how many will respond to it. I don't, I don't know. That's not, that's, not in my, that's not in my hands. But he called us there and he brought us back. I don't know why he called me to go there. I don't even speak German. But every one of us is called to be somewhere with the, with the word. Jesus says, all power is given unto me. Now he has endued us with power with the Holy Spirit. I want to pray this morning that we all receive a touch from God. There's some folks that's afraid of the Holy Ghost. Don't be afraid of it. Oh, no. So I just sense, Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to pray. Father, I pray, God, that you would reach down your hand this morning. Father, that there are those, first of all, there are those in here who have been filled with the Holy Spirit that perhaps maybe have been in a dry spell. Father, I pray you would pour out once again with your loving kindness, pour out your Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray for everyone in this room that first of all, the main thing, of course, is that we all know you as our Lord and Savior. That we're convinced and we know in our heart that our faith and trust is in the shed 